Well, good day, friends, and we're so glad that you've taken the time to join us for our little study in the book of Philippians. We've been looking at this letter now for a number of weeks through the lens of the habits of happiness. We're in the second week of talking about God's promise to the generous. This will also be the final study in the book of Philippians. And I encourage you to subscribe, hit the subscription button that's just below me. And uh, then when we start our next series, you can jump in. I got an interesting note from one of you that said uh, that you were going to do a YouTube marathon with all these studies. This is number 30. There's 30 plus hours of study going on here. I trust that that dear gentleman survives. But uh, let me say to those of you who have faithfully journeyed with us, God bless you and thank you so much for investing the time. I trust that this has been of some spiritual benefit for you. There's been some game-changing moments in this study for me as I've begun to even at, even at my uh, venerable age of spiritual growth to, uh, to begin to put together some of the pieces of the puzzle that I had not connected before. And uh, this has been a tremendous benefit, especially during the pandemic lockdown, when we've got a little, some of us have a little extra time on our hands to do some additional investing in our spiritual development. And I want to thank you all who've been praying for me and uh, your prayers have been successful. We are now completing, wrapping up our study in the book of Philippians. I, my friend said I had a face best suited to radio, but here we are 10 months later, and God has been faithful to good and good, and I am so grateful. Now let's le leap into it, shall we? As Paul closes this letter in the fourth chapter in the 19th verse, he sets out one of the promises that is numbers among the greatest and certainly one of the most all-encompassing in all of scripture. It's very familiar. If you've been around church any time at all, you've likely heard it repeated a time or two. And here's what it says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So my question, I guess, as I look at this verse, is why do you and I then seem to have so many needs that remain unmet? Why are there so many things that aren't happening. If God is indeed going to supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, why am I coming up short? And the answer to that question, most simply put, is found in the little statement that we borrowed from Pastor Rick Warren. Every Bible promise has a premise. That means that everything that God has said by way of a promise has a condition attached to it. He says, if you'll do this, I'll do that. I'll do that if you'll do this. And so God has been working these promises for generations. And those who have engaged with them have reaped the benefits of it. And this passage of scripture is dealing very specifically with the habit of generosity. That's what Philippians 4.19 is a reflection of. It's a reflection of the generosity of the church at Philippi. It's the only reason we have this letter today. The letter is a letter of thanksgiving for an offering received. The only reason that Paul stopped to pen the letter was to give a formal word of thanksgiving. And that letter has survived to this day, and we are certainly blessed by it. But we're being blessed because of the habit of generosity exercised by the church at Philippi. So with that in mind, would you take a Bible, please, and turn to Philippians chapter 4, and we'll read our theme passage for this section one last time together as we wrap up this study, and we will look at the five benefits or blessings of generosity as we do so. So get your Bible out, and here we go. We're ready to go. Are you ready? I trust you are. Let's read. I'm reading from the ESV, if that helps you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Yet, verse 14 begins, it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you helped me, sent, me, sent help for my needs once and again. 
Not that I seek the gift, Paul writes, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God, here's the promise, will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God and Father, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, once again, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to us afresh today and to alert us to the things that we need to learn and the things that we need to hear and see as we progress in our journey towards becoming more like your son, Jesus. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The verse that first comes to mind when I consider generosity is a verse in the book of Proverbs that's on your screen, chapter 11, verse 17. Here's what it says. The merciful, kind, and generous man, there's, the, there's what we're looking for, the generous man, benefits himself for his deeds return to bless him. What does that mean? Well, I understand that to mean that you get out of life what you invest in it. The generous man benefits himself because his deeds... The decisions that he's made to give and to, in his giving and living return to bless him. God has established laws in the universe. And one of them is simply this. You're going to sow, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Whatever you plant, you're going to harvest. Whatever you give out, you're going to get back. And the biggest challenge of the harvest for me is that I always get back more than whatever I put out. The saying goes this way, and I've said it before. You can tell, you can see how many seeds are in an apple, but you can't tell how many apples are in a seed. And it's the seed that we're sowing right now that is producing fruit in our lives. And the generous man benefits himself because although he can count the number of seeds that he put in the ground, he cannot count the incalculable benefit that may come out of them in his lifetime. But here's what I know. You always get back more of whatever it is that you give out, whether good or bad. And as I mentioned, the habit of generosity then, which is our theme, practically lived out, has five benefits that as a byproduct can produce happiness. So let's do a quick review of the first two and then we'll keep going. The first one of the benefits or the blessings of generosity is simply this. I earn the gratitude of others. When I consider the people in my life that I am most grateful for, it is the people who invested time and money and energy and patience and training me and discipling me along the journey. They have blessed me. I'm the most grateful for the people who have given the most to me. My parents number among the greatest, certainly, in that number. And if others have been stingy, I'm grateful for what they gave me, but I can see the limits of what they've given. And also, un unfortunately, having lived a little longer now, I can see the limits of what they've received back as well. Someone has said everyone is good for something, even if it's just a bad example. And look at these next verses with me. I've kind of pushed together verse 3, 5, and 7 in bits and pieces. Look at them with me and see what Paul says. Every time I think of you, this is chapter 1 of Philippians, I give thanks to God because you've been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. It's right that I should feel about you as I do, for you have a very special place in my heart. We've shared together in the blessings of God. And those of you who have studied with us all the way through this book certainly have shared with us the blessings of the gospel, and I am grateful for you as well. But that's the first thing that we learn is that Paul offered gratitude to the church at Philippi. When I give, when I practice the habit of generosity, what I gain is the gratitude of others. The second thing, the second benefit or blessing of generosity is that I demonstrate what matters most. When I give, when I'm generous with my time or my money or my energy or my skills, whatever, I'm showing what matters most to me. Because as one man so clearly said, and rightly said, if I could get a look at your checkbook or your account balance statement and your day timer, I can tell what matters most to you. Because of the way that your money is spent and the way that your time is spent, 
I can clearly see what matters most. And Jesus said it this way, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your heart? Well, have a look at your checkbook or your balance statement and have a look at your time management. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul said to the church, I want you to understand what really matters. And Paul's opening remarks in Philippi, or to the church at Philippi, identify his purpose. He wants you and I to understand what really matters, and the way that I give of myself and my resources demonstrates, as we've learned on our way through, what really matters in my life. And so we want our children and our grandchildren, our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers all to know that it's not just a matter that our spirituality, that our, that our life in Christ is not just a matter of talk. It's a matter of lifestyle and living. We want to show them by what we work for and what we work at what matters most. So since my life is in Christ, my life is about learning to love and give as he did. And what mattered most to Christ was relationships. Relationships with people. People are what matter. And Paul said, I want you to understand what really matters. And it was the people that were in his life, including the Philippian church. So what is my generosity and what is my giving reveal about me? What is a reveal is most important to me? Because Jesus said, where my treasure was, there my heart would be also. Those are the first two things that I learned, the first two benefits of generosity. I earn the gratitude of others, and I'm telling everybody about what I invest in with my time and my finances or whatever and whatever else I have, what matters most to me. The third benefit is that I become more like Jesus. Why? Well, because Jesus was the most generous person who ever lived. Jesus as is a giver, just as his father is a giver. God, the three in one, the Trinity, are all givers. So why am I becoming more like Jesus? Because that's always been God's intention for you and me. If there was ever any doubt about what God wants out of you, here's what it is. Look at it with me again in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Because those he foreknew, the people he called, he also predestined, for what purpose? To be conformed to the image of his Son. God's full intention for you and me, all things are working together for good. What good? The conforming of us to the image of his Son. It doesn't mean the good that you perceive or that I perceive necessarily. God is bringing everything together in our lives for the good, that is, so that we will be conformed to the image of his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. This is most, uh, most clearly demonstrated in a scripture verse that is probably very familiar to you. It's the one they always hold up at the football game on a big cardboard. John 3.16, what does it say? Well, it simply says this, that God so loved the world. There it is. There's God's priority. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You would only give your son to something you consider a priority. So this is priority one. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Giving is the essence of who God is. So God gave his highest gift, his one unique son, to save the world. Giving is the essence of God then. Giving himself is what the son did so that we could see what God intended and be saved, reconciled and restored after he gave his own life as a sacrifice for our sins. So God's a giver. And if God wasn't a giver, none of us would be right now, here right now because everything that is good in our lives is a gift of God. Everything that's good in my life, everything that's good in your life is clearly a gift of God. That's what James tells us in chapter 1, verse 17. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father. God is the giver of all good things. And God wants his children to become like him. People who give 
good gifts. And every time I practice generosity appropriately, I become a little bit more like Jesus. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. Here it is, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. Christ coming into my life is transforming my life. All true goodness in my life is produced by the work of Jesus in me. And so what I'm telling you here is it clearly very counterculture because everything in our culture says doesn't say give, it says get. And I think we're increasingly becoming a self-centered culture if we weren't already before. In my opinion, narcissism is on the rise. We don't just do good for goodness sake anymore. Rather, when I'm listening to people, they say, I should do something good, so I'll feel better. Well, there's an element of truth to that, but the motivation's a little off. It's all about me and myself and I. It's about my stuff and my needs and I, I, I. The middle letter of crime is I. The middle letter of pride is I. The middle letter of sin is I. And as the old evangelist used to say, I think we have an I problem in this culture. I think he's right. So when I learn the habit of generosity, what happens? The first thing that happens with generosity is that I get my eyes off me and my eyes, my mind, and my heart turns to consider the plight of others. And that's God's goal for me. Remember Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 to 6? Look at it with me. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Become like Jesus. That's what God wants me to do. Become like Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, the Bible continues, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave. God wants us to become like Jesus and be prepared to give up our privileges for the sake of others as his own son did for us. God wants me to become like Jesus. That's the third benefit of becoming a generous person. What's the fourth one? Is that I strengthen my faith. My faith gets stronger. Why is that? Because when I take something I've got and instead of using it for myself, use it to bless someone else, then I got to have to depend on God to help me in the sh with the shortfall. I don't know how many times you've reached out to help a friend or a neighbor and you uh, have a to-do list that you're working through and somebody needed help next door or across the back or wherever they were or a friend from across town called and said, listen, can you give me a hand? And you realize that your to-do list was going to go up in smoke because you didn't have enough time and you are not going to have enough energy to complete your list if you go and help your friend. And so you have to make a decision in that moment and you stretch your faith to believe that God is going to help you accomplish whatever needs to be accomplished today and then probably go and help your friend. Say I've got enough money that I need to pay the bills and then in prayer I come to the conclusion that I need to help some global worker that's at work overseas because he's in a difficult spot or he's in the middle of a project that needs some assistance. And I give away a certain portion of my funds that actually I stand in need of. Well now I've got to trust God to meet my needs. Well it's not a bad place to be in but it's certainly a very stretching place to be in. I've only got a certain amount of time and I've got to get my stuff done and I choose to help and stop my neighbor. Now I've got to trust God to help me with my little bit, with the little time that I've got left to figure out what's most important and get that done as well. It takes faith, friends, to give. It takes faith to give of your finances without expecting to be repaid. That's what Jesus said. Give and don't expect it back. That's really tough for us. But that's what he said. Because we have to have faith that our gifts meet the needs of others, that our gift is pleasing to God, and then, then, and then that God will faithfully provide for our own needs in the future, whatever the shortfall may be. And Paul gives these instructions with regard to that to the Corinthian church. Have a look at them with me, if you would, please. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. 
and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Did you see that instruction? He said, "Don't. there's no high pressure giving here. What God wants you to do is to act out of a spirit of generosity, having aligned your heart and your mind with his principles and his promises, and you decide in your heart what you can do. You decide how far to stretch. You don't let the preacher or the banker or anybody else push you into something that you shouldn't be doing. You decide in your own heart how much you're going to give or put towards a certain cause and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver, not a questioning giver, not a struggling giver. God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And here's what Paul says will be the response. And God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Give according to your faith so you can give happily, cheerfully. You're not to be pressured by others to give concerning what the amount that you give is going to be yours to decide. Now, I'm not talking about taxes and groceries here. I'm talking about free will giving to bless and to benefit others. Faith building giving is a process and it's a learning process. As you see God at work in your life, by your faith, you'll increase your giving to the priorities of God. Paul says God will prove himself faithful if you'll put him to the test and that should encourage you to be even more generous. Look at verse 10 and 11 of uh, 2 Corinthians 9, just following the ones we read. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. Did you see those two things? God provides seed. Seed is to be sown. Some of the seed is for eating. We grind our wheat and make bread with it. That's what we do with it. But not all of our seeds. Some of our seed is for sowing. And Paul is saying quite clearly here that sometimes when God gives you money what he's looking for you to do is to discern between what portion is to be seeded for the future and what portion is to be plan is to be used at the present time for making bread in the same way he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity you can't have a great harvest of generosity if you ate all the seed if you absorb everything on your own priorities and on your own self, then you've seeded nothing into the ground. You put nothing in, let me tell you what you get out. You get nothing back out. It's the law of sowing and reaping. So give according to your faith. Whatever you can give happily, God will prove himself. In fact, Paul talks very highly about the offering that he received from the Philippian church. Look at it here with me. Oh, wait a minute. Back to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 11. He says, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Once you learn the principle, you'll be able to always be generous. Why? Because you'll begin to discern between what it is you're supposed to be using for yourself and the portion that God is giving you in order to place into the hands of someone else or to invest someplace else. Look at Philippians 4.18. Here was what Paul said about their offering to him. At the moment, he said, I have all I need and more. You've abundantly supplied my need. I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me with Epaphroditus. Here's what he says about them as far as God is concerned. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. That's just good news. In other words, they had stretched out in their faith, and as you read the letter, you discover that. Not everybody had had a lot to give, but some of them had given sacrificially to, uh, to in this offering because they believed in Paul and what Paul was doing and what God was going to be able to do through Paul. Little did they know that their sacrificial giving would result in a letter that would bless us for generations to come. But they needed to know, and so Paul told them, that they had found the favor of God, for they'd given in alignment with his will. And that's supposed to be, and it was for them, a faith builder. When I learn to do things in God's time, in God's way, my faith in God and his word increases. Every time I walk with God, when I'm in step with his design, and give of myself and my resources, my faith 
grows stronger. Each opportunity I choose to take advantage of to practice this habit of generosity, it's like a muscle that I'm working out at the gym. The more I work it, the better it works. Fifthly and finally, here's the final benefit or blessing of generosity. Not only do I strengthen my faith, but I invest in my eternal reward. The Bible says that every time I invest the resources that God has given me, because I don't have anything aside from what he's given me, friends, I express generosity and God is keeping track of my generosity. When I give my time and my energy and my skills, whatever I invest my time in is going also towards my eternal reward. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. You've likely heard it. Look at it with me again. Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt or destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but rather accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven. Did you see that? Where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Underline that phrase in your Bible, store up for yourselves, not for God, not for others. When you give faithfully to God, you store up for yourself. Life is not about storing stuff here. Life is about preparing for the life that is to come. Because all that I accumulate here is staying here. I've never seen a U-Haul trailer pulled by a hearse. Why? Because you can't take it with you. All I can do is to the best of my ability, faithfully invest what God has given me in time, talent, and treasure in this life in hope that it is going to make a difference here and later there. The Bible says by investing in people and methods God is using to facilitate and reconcile others to himself, other people will be meeting me in, me in eternity. That will be the blessing and the benefit, and God will reward it. That's one of the things that he does. Because here's the thing I know. There are only two things that are going to outlast this life. One is the word of God, therefore the promises that he has made. And secondly, people. You look around. One day the buildings we live in, where we gather, will all crumble, and all the stuff of this life will, will vanish. Therefore, the only reason I would invest in the stuff of this life is to reap a reward in the life that would come. The life that would come after this one. Nothing on this broken planet is going to last. Only two things last. Let me say it again. The Word of God and people. That's all. The people that choose to become the members of God's family. And you and I will be compensated for everything we have expended on behalf of others if not in this life, then certainly in the next. And Jesus said this in the context of offering hospitality to other people who were in the circle of faith. Look at this with me, Matthew 10, 40 to 42. Anyone who welcomes you, he's talking to his disciples now, welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus said that if we welcome someone into our circle of hospitality, for a meal or for fellowship or for whatever. He said, if you welcome one of mine into the circle, then you not only welcome him, but you welcome me. And not only do you welcome me, you welcome the one who sent me, who is the Father. And whoever welcomes someone known to be a prophet will receive the prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes someone known to be a righteous man will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who is known to be my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly be rewarded. You giving Are you giving away your time in the name of Jesus? Then if it is, you are, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. Are you giving away your energy in the name of Jesus? Well, then you will be rewarded in heaven. If you're giving away your money because of Jesus and the cause of Christ, then that too will count towards a reward in heaven. Look at what Paul says here. He says, I invest in my inter eternal home. And I'm really glad you Philippians are being generous because you're actually storing up for yourself treasure 
in heaven. There's going to be a reward when you get there. Watch the way the Amplified Bible takes this verse, Philippians 4, verse 15 to 17, and kind of pulls out of it the things that are intended in there, but Paul doesn't specifically say, are you Philippians? And you Philippians know that in the early days of preaching the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you send a gift more than once to meet my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I do seek the profit. What profit, Paul? Which increases to your heavenly account. My heavenly account. Oh, let me tell you what that's saying. In the Greek language, that's an interest-bearing bank account. Paul says that when you and I invest, he says, when you invest in me, he says, the profit that comes back to you increases your heavenly account. There's a blessing, he said, which is accumulating for you. He's using earthly metaphors to try and help us grasp eternal principles. Friends, here's my question to you. How is your account faring? And so he urges the Colossians, in light of this idea, in chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do then, and word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. If you can do this legitimately for Christ, if you can't, he said, I don't know whether you should even bother. However, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do everything looking to benefit and to bless Christ. Whatever you do, if it can be done in Jesus' name, in other words, it aligns with God's plans and his purposes, whether it's treating your family well or taking care of global workers like Paul, feeding the hungry, helping someone accomplish a task using a skill or a talent to bless others, whether you're serving or teaching or loving, caring, whatever it is. Here's the key. Uh, here's my question. Are you investing? How are you doing with your retirement account? I'm not talking about your RSPs and your TFSAs and whatever other letters we can put together for investment. I'm talking about your ERA. There's one for you. Your eternal retirement account. Friends, have you said anything on, it, on ahead? Is there going to be anything in heaven for you? Or are you just piling it all on, up on this side for yourself and your kids? That's called a fatal error. No less than six times... Jesus says in the New Testament that you and I need to learn to think differently about eternity. All of this life is preparation for eternity. Nothing in this life is going to last except people in God's word. Therefore, everything that I do must be to invest in people and in God's commission, God's plans and purposes in this life. We need to learn to think differently. We're going, not going to live comparatively long here. I might live to be 80, maybe 100. There's lots of folks living that long now, I understand. But even that, what is that in the light of eternity, forever and forever with Jesus? Where do you want your investment to be? Friends, we need to invest in those things that send it on ahead. That kind of generosity is a statement of faith to anyone who would observe concerning what we believe about our future and, and the investments that we're making in our eternal dwellings. Proverbs says that every time you give to a poor man, you're lending to the Lord. Do you know that? Proverbs 19:17. whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. It's not the poor man that's going to repay you. It's the Lord. You're making an investment in your eternal dwelling. You say, how do I do those kinds of things? Well, Paul, Paul tells Timothy this. He's talking about the rich, but he kind of lays it out for us in this next segment. Let's have a look. Command those who are rich in this world's good. And if you live in Canada, you live in the top 8% of everybody who is on planet Earth right now in, a, in, 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 in anything about wealth or anything like that. You say, well, I'm not very wealthy. Well, you're still in the top 8% at the very least just because you have home and the benefits that Canada provides. Command those who are rich in this world's goods, and many of us are, not to be haughty or to set their hope on riches, which are uncertain. We may not always live this well. 
but on God who richly provides us with all things for our enjoyment. In other words, put your hope in God. He'll take care of whatever it is that you need. Tell them, here's what I need you to do. Tell them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous givers, sharing with others. There's the way to put money in your heavenly bank account. Doing good, rich in good deeds, generous to others, sharing with others. In this way, they will save up a treasure for themselves. Did you see that? They will save up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the future. Foundation for what future? Their eternal future in heaven with God. And that way, he said, they lay hold of what is truly life. Not just the good life here, but real life on the other side. So every time I'm generous, I earn the gratitude of others. I show what really matters. I become more like Jesus. I strengthen my faith. And I invest in my eternal home. When you, God says, are like these Philippians who are noted for their habit of generosity. He says, when you give out of gratitude, when you give to become more like Jesus, when you give to stretch your faith, to invest in your home in heaven, to show what really matters, God says, the habit of generosity is the premise for receiving out of the promise in Philippians chapter 4, 19. You can be sure then that God will take care of everything you need. His generosity exceeding yours. I love the way the message paraphrase puts that. In the glory that pours from Christ Jesus. Believing friend, God says let's walk together. I've invested in you. I want you to do something with that investment. In your love for one another, be generous Give to others in need. Demonstrate this habit of happiness and I'll see your needs met. You'll store up treasure in heaven from your investment and my joy will be in you and your joy will be full because not only do you have fullness in this life in whatever limited form that takes, but you will have a full life and receive a full reward when you get to the other end. Friends, our Heavenly Father is watching over you and me every day of our lives. And he's longing to see us develop the family traits that he has illustrated for us in the life of his own son. And we've called these the habits of happiness as they're laid out for us in the book of Philippians. And for 30 weeks, we've tried to help you take hold of the keys that unlock many of the precious promises of God that will help you increase your level of happiness as you adopt them into your personal routines. Friends, God observes and engages with us daily through the inner working of the Holy Spirit. Every day, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit watch to see how, what, how we will make use of the gifts of grace, the blessings, the mercy, the power to be transformed, along with our skills, talent, resources, the time and the opportunities that he's going to lay out in our lap for us. God is waiting to see how this habit that we've talked about today of consistent generosity and all the other habits that we've spent hours pouring over in the book of Philippians. How are these changing our lives to more accurately reflect the joy so that we reflect the joy and the happiness that he, the Father and the Son and the Spirit know in intimate union with each other. And God has shared these principles with us so that we can know his joy in this life. Do you know it today? Everything I've studied, friends, is to show you how the premises behind the promises work. Go back through the book of Philippians. Look at the highlighting you've done. Go back through and maybe look at some of the videos again if you think they may be of some further assistance to you. Because God brings Paul to the end of this letter with this all-encompassing promise that encapsulates not only the critical habit of generosity, but the, all the others in the book of Philippians 2. Look at what he says one last time. And this same God, Paul says, who takes care of me, will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God, our Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, today, I want to thank you for all that you've given me. I want to thank you for 
all that you've made me, that you've created me, that you gifted me, that you saved me, that I have been born and blessed to live in Canada. Thank you for the relative freedoms that I enjoy here. Thank you for the measure of help I've been blessed with. Thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear, not just physically, but spiritually. Thank you for my wife and my children. Thank you for this church and thank you for friends. I thank you for the joy of knowing purpose in my life. Thank you, God. I thank you for how you've been able to use my life this far and how you've blessed me. And Lord, in the opening weeks of 2021, remind me and those who are listening with me of these habits of happiness that we've spent many hours studying together. I ask that you would transform our lives afresh through this final habit of generosity, learning to give as you have given to us. Holy Spirit, guide us. Give to the world through us. Not just what we think we can afford in time and resources, but empower us daily to give to our families and to your family and to our community at large, that they may be blessed, that we may experience and exemplify your joy and happiness in our lives, showing the world what really matters. We ask that your blessing would be upon each one who has taken the time to Study with us today that your grace abound towards them in the days that lie ahead. In Christ's name we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. And I have been praying for you. I was wandering around in the sanctuary even this morning praying for you all and uh, praying through Third John chapter 1, verse 2 that you would be blessed and that your body would be as healthy as your soul is and so many of you have got a measure of health and God has graced you and this COVID thing has not touched you. I believe that that's the blessing of God in this life and I am so grateful for his hand in all of it. The Bible says one man gives freely and gains more, another withholds unduly but, be, but comes to poverty. A generous man, that's what we just finished studying in the book of Philippians, will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And I just want to take a moment again to thank you for your generosity and for your continued support here at Full Gospel Church. You have been a tremendous blessing to us and you have been a tremendous blessing through us. You gave us a great offering over the holiday season that we turned around and distributed to various charities in the community. And we were so grateful to be able to give and we couldn't give without you and you gave and we just turned around and handed it out to the Salvation Army and a number of other significant places in this community that stand in need. And we are grateful for your giving. If you want to give to Full Gospel Church, here's what you need to know. You can give via PayPal. If you're connected to PayPL, if you'll get on the church website, fgcniagara.com, click on resources on that drop-down box, what should show up. One of them will be giving. Click on that. And the box, the PayPal box, will appear there. And you can give your offering that way if you choose. If you choose to give via e-transfer, fullgospel.church1 at gmail.com is the way that you can give that offering. We've been receiving offerings in the mail here at Full Gospel Church. And we are so grateful for your gifts and your donations. Somebody left food outside the door yesterday. And I pulled it in and uh, put it in the Salvation Army box. God bless you, every one of you, for your giving and for remembering not just the assembly, but the folks that stand in need around us and giving generously towards the uh, Salvation Army and the other groups that we network with in this community. Some of you are wondering about Sunday mornings during this uh, stay-at-home full lockdown time. Our connect time is the live is is on 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. That's when the live stream runs. And uh, if you are trying to connect with that, get to our Facebook page. Just say, how do I get there? Let me tell you how. <laughs> get into your Google search engine or whatever search engine you're using, and and uh, and type in Full Gospel Church of Niagara. Two things should come up. One of them will be our Facebook page. One of them will be the website. Click on the Facebook page. You don't have to be a member of Facebook to get into that particular page. It's an open page. When you get there, you'll see a line across the top with some words in it. One of them says posts. Click on that, would you? 
and that will be a drop down box and all of a sudden things will drop down in front of you there you'll find instructions to connect with the Sunday morning service to connect with the next in the series that we will begin very shortly for midweek study for the other things that are going on you'll be able to get information there at this time if you uh, miss some of the things on giving all of that Caitlin regularly lays out for your uh, benefit and blessing there and so please take advantage of it as we continue forward in 2021 we are looking for the blessing of God in a very difficult time and we're praying for you we're grateful that you're praying for us I ask I pray to the Lord today that you will know his peace his comfort and his joy in all that goes on let the grace of God go with you amen